Good morning, um, good afternoon, uh, good evening, um, dear participants. Uh, I would like to, to welcome you all uh, to the parallel session two of the um, 2021 uh, Global Symposium on Soil uh, Biodiversity. Uh, it is a great honor uh, to be here uh, with all of you today. Uh, my name is uh, Rosa Cuevas, and I will be moderating this two-hour session. Uh, during the first hour, uh, we will be listening uh, uh, to four presentations of uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, I will uh, kindly um, remind uh, the presenters uh, to keep uh, to the 10 minutes so that we can have time uh, for the Q uh, a uh, 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 sessions uh, at minute uh, nine of your intervention. I will let you know uh, that there is one minute uh, left uh, in order to have time uh, to discuss. Uh, and uh, before starting, I kindly ask you, all of you, to check the Zoom chat as some rules and information on this session will be now uh, post. Uh, for the Q, um, QA uh, session, uh, please use the chat to, po to, um, uh, to uh, the chat. Sorry, to post uh, your questions and include um, at the beginning um, the name of the presenter and to whom uh, your question is addressed. Uh, we will choose a few questions uh, to be answered. Uh, leave and the rest will be answered uh, via chat. Uh, the host of the meeting is um, uh, Julia uh, Sheldon. Um, uh, she is here to help you uh, for any technical issues, so, uh, issues, so please uh, do not hesitate uh, to write to her directly using the private uh, message. Uh, with our, uh, without uh, further ado, I would like uh, uh, to give uh, uh, the floor to uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Nol, uh, Nolwen uh, uh, Bougon uh, from France uh, with the title of the presentation Soil Biodiversity from Science uh, to Action. Feedback from two uh, decades, decades of soil indicators development as agricultural soil management tool. Um, thank you, Rosa. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I will try to share the screen. Um, oh, it will be good. Uh, where is my presentation? Sorry. Uh, maybe you have it. Um, it will be easier. Um, okay. Can you see it? It's okay. Yes. Could you share the screen? The um, uh, in uh, presentation mode. Please. I try. Is it okay here? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, hi everyone. I'm Norwen Bougon from the French Biodiversity Agency. And I speak today on behalf of my co-authors. And I, give, I will give you a feedback of two decades of uh, soil bioindicators development as agricultural soil management. And uh, most of those works are the results of uh, collaboration between researchers, French ministry in charge of agriculture and the one in charge of, of environment, and the two French environmental agencies the Agency for Ecological Transition and the French Biodiversity Agency. Though I will not be able to present you in details the, all the different projects. So if you have any question, you can contact us uh, at the end of the presentation or later. And uh, I put all the, um, I put some uh, uh, contact at the end of the presentation. So why do we need to study soil biodiversity? Soil biodiversity is part of the solution to the two most pressing challenges of our time, biodiversity loss and climate changes. And the concept of uh, soil health has been defined as the capacity of uh, soil function as a living and dynamic ecosystem. A healthy soil also contribute to um, 
uh, contribute to many ecosystems function, for example, for contribute to the mitigation of climate changes by maintaining or increasing its carbon content. Recently, a mission board of uh, the European Commission for Soil, Health and Food submitted a target of 75% of healthy soil in European Union by 2030. And preservation of soil, so is no longer an option. And it is one stake of the French biodiversity plan. But, so we introduce the concept of soil, of soil health, but how do we diagnose them? A parallel can be done to human health. To set a diagnosis, doctors use different sets of indicators to determine symptoms or signs of specific disease or dysfunctioning. To follow the health of a court, monitoring can be used. It helps, for example, to gain knowledge of factors of transmission, to gain references of new medicines, for example. And when new tools or treatments are available, the medical community has to be trained to update the diagnosis. So, oh, sorry, for soils, this device can easily be, easily be applied. In fact, in France, um, the implementation of the French biodiversity plan is built on several initiatives launched in the last two decades to explore, understand soil biodiversity and to develop indicators relevant for soil quality and land use decision. Different projects were uh, dedicated to the development of soil bioindicators and their applicability to assess soil functions. For example, the program bioindicators had the objective uh, to promote the standardization of bioindicators, to monitor soil quality, and to identify relevant indicators for ecological risk assessment. Here are presented sets of indicators that can be used for monitoring agricultural soil and also can be used to manage soil organic matter or agricultural practices. Another example is uh, a group of experts published a guidance uh, at the demand of uh, the French Ministry of Agriculture. And that guidance inventories the most usable bioindicators and tools that can be used by farmers by themselves to assess an, uh, their organic and biological states of soil. At large scale, indicator can be implemented in monitoring network to spatially ass assess their soil quality, to gain references values, and also to monitor the states of uh, soil biodiversity. In France, inventories of, on soil microbial biomass and bacterial communities were conducted at the national level based on uh, the French soil quality network. It represents around 2,200 sites for all major land uses. And it permitted, for example, the production of the first French atlas of uh, soil bacterial community. And it's presented here on the right of the presentation. And also a new initiative is actually in progress. It's a soil biodiversity survey based on the French soil quality network also. And it will be presented tomorrow by Camille Humbert during the session three, SIM one. In addition to research programs, participatory networks are also on the rise. It's another way to gain amount of data uh, throughout the territory and repeatedly over time. And it's also another way to alert and uh, awareness and training tools and alert to citizens, farmers, professional on soil preservation. For example, um, in France, volunteer professionals and gardeners are encouraged to participate to the, to the observatory of earthworms and uh, the agricultural observatory of biodiversity. If you want some information, you can directly go to the sites that, that are indicated here. And uh, as we say before, uh, in training is also uh, and sharing is a, is a big part of the of the use of uh, of indicators. In fact, to be used, indicators need to be known, to be usable, and also to be understood. So transfer from research to end users are essential. 
And training is uh, one of uh, the key steps. A collaborative project uh, called Agrinov Project uh, has involved uh, researchers uh, on biology, on soil bioindicators with a network of uh, 250 farmers. And it has developed uh, and transferred training and uh, dashboard indicators on soil bi biological indicators directly to farmers. And the experimentation and monitoring network for cultural innovation takes over from the Agrinov project to train farmers with the aim of changing their farming system towards environmental and economic sustainability. Also, to be the appropriation of biological tools require that the methods are recognized, reliable, and comparable. So standardization is one of the solutions. Here are presented indicators standardized at the international level by the ISO TC 190 committee. And uh, the appropriation also of biological tools requires the existence of a supply market to meet the needs. In France, we have uh, programs that support the development of the French industrial sector of, of future. And since 2014, different projects were funding considering soil biodiversity services, brownfield redevelopment, and environmental monitoring. And last but not least, we focus our presentation on bioindicators. But to communicate with land users and land managers, uh, talking about soil function and soil and ecosystem services are more powerful. And uh, we can see an increasing need to assess ecosystem services. And uh, methods are actually in development and are already used by uh, consul consultants. And for information, a new ISO working group on the valuation of ecosystem and function uh, provided by Saul as uh, his first meeting in uh, March 21. And if you are interested, you can contact directly my colleague Antonio Bispo. And I think, I think he's here today, so you can ask some questions if you want. And to conclude, uh, the last two decades has permitted the development of biological tools, and some are being relevant and can be implemented to assess ecosystem function and services of soil. But we still have work to do. Uh, for example, we will need to develop and standard, uh, standardize the interpretation framework. We need to improve uh, database and reference values. We also need to improve the links with agriculture uh, practices and to soil function and ecosystem services. We also need to keep an effort on uh, in rising awareness and training, for example, with participatory, with participatory approach, but, but also by implying notably citizens and politics. And here I can uh, show you, you can here see uh, two uh, raising, awareness raising of game, card games uh, produced during a program called GESOL. And um, uh, the French variation of uh, soil Andes, yes, and I'm finished. And soil Andes that it, you can see uh, in French is hashtag plant on sleep. So it's another way to to alert and uh, to awareness uh, uh, citizens. So if you have any question, you can contact us directly. And thank you for being here today and for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, uh, Nolwen. Uh, and also it's uh, interesting to know about this new uh, ISO, about the valuation of ecosystem uh, services. Uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to the next uh, presenter, um, Eva, Mrs. Eva uh, Bellemain. Uh, with the presentation using environmental DNA to assess global soil biodiversity and build a soil quality um, bioindicator. Um, please, um, Eva, uh, the, the floor is yours, Mrs. Eva.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I think you didn't hear the, the first uh, slide, so I can present it again. You can see the screen, right? Okay, so yeah, I'm Eva Belmont. I'm the president of uh, Argali. This is a company specialized in the use of environmental DNA to assess biodiversity, especially in terrestrial ecosystems. So here I'm going to talk about bioindication of soil quality based on environmental DNA. So why do we need a global indicator of soil quality? I guess everyone in the audience is aware now, after two days of symposium, why we need uh, to assess uh, soil quality. And in the context of uh, polluted and degraded sites, so for example, in France, we have about 7,000 polluted sites and actually more and more money is spent on soil restoration. For example, it was more than 470 million euros in 2010. But actually we lack adaptive protocols and indicators to assess the recovery of ecosystems. Actually, it's quite difficult to characterize the potential, uh, the biological potential of the soil at a point in time and to follow its restoration through time and to recover functionality. So we need to construct dedicated indicators in link with the ecosystem services for an efficient monitoring of the soil compartment. So those indicators need to be standardized, reliable, of course, ideally inexpensive and also easily applied. So we can use, of course, traditional indicators, uh, but some of them have some limitations, for example, with physical chemical indicators, looking at pH or nitrogen carbon contents. We don't, um, we cannot assess the level of soil functionality of richness. So then we need to complement with biological indicators. And in this case, we look at uh, richness, abundance of specific groups, bioindicator groups, usually, for example, annelids, nematodes, microtropods, bacteria or fungi. And uh, actually, they can be a high temporal and spatial variability in those groups, according to the soil, according to climatic conditions. We also need experts to look at the morphological identification. And this can be quite time consuming and quite expensive. So this is why I'm going to present now the use of the eDNA metabarcoding tool as a tool to assess biodiversity in soil and infer soil quality. So eDNA stands for environmental DNA. It is now recognized as an efficient and reliable tool to assess uh, biodiversity, also to detect the presence of uh, target species. And uh, there are several advantages of using this method. So first, from a single analysis, we can assess the diversity of taxa of the target group. So let's take this example. We collect a soil sample. So this would be like 15 grams of soil from a sample that has been homogenized beforehand. We extract the DNA, we amplify it, and then we sequence it. And from the sequences that we obtain, we compare to reference databases and we can identify the organisms that are present in this sample. So here, if we use the eukaryote primers, for example, we can identify uh, plants, animals, and uh, fungi that are present in the sample. So it's possible to standardize this analysis both temporally and spatially. And this is also quite independent of climatic conditions or seasons. The analysis can be made without any a priori, so we don't need to know in advance uh, what organisms are present in the soils to be able to assess the diversity. The sampling, the sampling protocol is actually quite easy, fast, and can be standardized. Um, this was back in 2012, and this was one of the first studies to look at uh, soil eDNA, and it was comparing botanical surveys and eDNA metabarcoding. So here, the size of the picture represents the observation with the botanical survey on the left and the eDNA metabarcoding, the proportion of sequences on the right. So actually, the same species are identified with both methods, but uh, with different proportions. And actually, there were 71 plants identified with the botanical survey 
and uh, six of them were not identified with the DNA. So this is a limitation of the eDNA metaboboding uh, approach, but they actually represent less, one, less than 1% 1 of the biomass. So globally, this study was a proof of concept that the eDNA tool can be used as a, as a, uh, to assess plant diversity from soil samples, a proof of concept. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the pilot studies that we have uh, conducted, uh, mainly on polluted sites or rehabilitated sites. In this study, the objective was to evaluate if a DNA signature can be established from soil samples, with the objective to assess the degree of restoration of soil quality in polluted environments. So here we have a soil that has been polluted with hydrocarbons and heavy metals. You can see on the figure on the map, actually, uh, the part in gray with the gravels is the site that is being rehabilitated, rehabilitated. And actually, it's, uh, the actions include the spreading topsoil as well as, uh, as well as gravels to reestablish burn habitats. And uh, we also have the brownfield site where we took five samples uh, to compare with the rehabilitated site. So we sample a quadrat of one square meter, the 10 first centimeters of soil, uh, seven samples in total, corresponding to 20 pooled subsamples. And we take 15 grams of soil and two replicates per sample. Then we preserve the soil dry uh, using silica. So it can pre be preserved for several days, weeks, or even months uh, dry before we analyze it in the lab. So in the lab, we do the DNA extraction. We extract extracellular DNA in this case. We amplify the, the DNA using eukaryote primers with four replicates per sample. And then we run NGS sequencing. Uh, the bioinformatic and biostatistical analysis can be made with the OB tools or ROB tools. And here I can show some of the results. So this is the taxonomic composition of the soil samples. If we take all soil samples, we can see that we get mainly annelids, protozoans, and columbols in the soil. And for the plants, we get, we get mainly monocotyledons and mosses. If we look, um, if we discard now the plants and focus on... It's already 10 minutes, right? So we look at... Um, the, the statistical treatment of the data will allow to identify composite bioindicators depending on habitat type. So this can testify on the soil restoration without any a priori knowledge. If we focus on uh, columbola, uh, if we look at the relative frequency of columbolas between sample, we can see that uh, frequency is relatively higher in uh, the restored site compared to the brownfield site. And we can also see that uh, the sample structurates among um, axes such as the habitat, but also the pollution axis. So it, it, it looks like this uh, columbola group responds well to environmental variables and to habitat or pollution type. And this can be probably considered as a pioneer species. Uh, this is another study on a rehabilitation site. And here the idea was to compare the taxonomic diversity present in a soil that has been rehabilitated after landfill mining with a reference lo uh, soil located close to the study site, but without any anthropic activity. Those measures will serve as a first evaluation to, of the rehabilitation site to be able to monitor in the long term the soil trajectory. So here we can see that the habitats can be easily differentiated based on their uh, taxonomic composition. You have the open site with, uh, with the organisms corresponding to cornfields, and you have the forest area with organisms corresponding to, to the forest. Uh, and finally, another project where we look at the return of life in soil. So here the soil was excavated from a polluted site and treated for depollution. Such soils usually contain very few organisms. And here we assess how life returns back in the soil. So after mixing those soils, those excavated soils with amendments, we look at how life will come back in the soil. So we expect first 
bacteria to come back, then fungi, and then microfauna, mesofauna, macrofauna at the end. So in the study, we could see that even after six months, the, the richness was increasing. And if we look at the excavated soil, so here in gray on, this, on those figures, this, on the left you have eukaryotes and on the right you have bacteria. So we compare actually the excavated soils to amendment in brown to topsoil in gray. And then we look at those excavated soil in time, how they evolve in time. So you have in yellow, the, the excavated soil at T0, and then after six months in orange and 12 months in red. We can see here that the communities tend to aggregate by sampling dates, which means that they can evolve in time. And at T0, they are the closest to the one identified in the amendments. After six months or 12 months, they are actually closest to the one observed in local topsoil. So this pattern was actually more obvious with bacteria and then eukaryotes, meaning that probably there is a different response time between those different compartments. Um, it's important to, to conclude, Eva, sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is the conclusion. So DNA signature can be established from soil sample with the objective of assessing the degree of restoration of soil quality in polluted environments. And this can be considered as a global indicator for biological assessments, which can be standardized, inexpensive, and easily applied, regardless to climatic conditions. And to finish, I would like to give some perspective. So we are now beginning our R&D project with our partner, Biotop and Suez, to characterize the soil quality based on different parameters, including ecological parameters using eDNA. So this is a project that is financed by the French Ministry of Environment. And you, ultimately, your database will consider different types of soil at the national scale, and we can correlate DNA signature and ecosystem functions using machine learning approaches. It can also be used in the agriculture sector to contribute to the assessment of soil biological quality and guide agricultural practices. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for being a bit long. And don't hesitate to contact us if you have any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Um, before presenting um, the next uh, speaker, I would like to, to give uh, the word uh, to Mr. June uh, Muras, uh, the regional uh, moderator. We have uh, technical issues, and for that reason, I, I took uh, the moderation. Uh, please, uh, uh, June, uh, the, the word and the, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you, Rosa. So can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. So, so I'm sorry, I, I've been actually, I've been in the session, but uh, probably no one uh, uh, did identify me because my name is in Japanese, sorry. So I'm Jumarase, uh, ITPS. And I'm very happy uh, to take over the, uh, the job of uh, Rosa as a moderator continuously. So uh, because of limited time, so let's immediately move to the next uh, presentation. So given by uh, Mr. Raul uh, Arangren. So the title is Integrating Microbiological Quality Indicators and uh, Soil Properties Through Score Functions to Assess uh, Land Use Changes in Colombian Andesols. So Mr. Raul, the so floor is yours. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, but uh, I think all the guys because I'm in a rural area in Colombia. I'm with international. Um, a moment, share my screen. Okay. Um, sorry, can you see my screens correctly? Mm, so we are. I think we are still waiting. Okay, no. this is my first presentation of the result of 
my PhD research. Uh, this research is led by University of Antioquia and is supported by EPSP from Italy with the professor mm -hmm. Erika Lomini. Mr. Raul, Mr. Raul. Uh, Ah, yeah. yeah, okay. Now, uh, uh, now we got the first slide. Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Okay. And basically, we need to design a, a way to assess the soil quality, principally in Andesols in Colombia. Right now, we have a lot of problems because the industries like agriculture companies and mining projects are using continuously our soil's resources, but we don't have a clear measure to represent what is the real impact of these actions over the, the soil. And principally, we know that the soil quality assets is something specific depending on the environmental conditions and the ecological relation. And we want to find a simple set of indicators to assess soil quality index in the specific case of Colombian Andesols. But we want to obtain a measure with integrality, yes, with all lots of information. We want a measure with representability to a specific condition and trees for all soil functions with the capacity to differentiate different degrees of perturbation or land uses. But the most important that we want to obtain with our soil quality measure is a measure with the capacity to show early warnings or a signal of impact. Also with a simple interpretation, it's complex try to integrate a lot of measure that uh, we consider important but what is the correct way to integrate and show a clear result about the soil condition? And obviously with a low cost, because the idea is try to implement this measure in big areas and territories like municipalities, like departments, like countries entire, and to try to obtain uh, a, a first landscape, a first measure of the national soil conditions. And um, we select areas to make a pilot study in the central area of Colombia, in the department of Antioquia. We select three municipalities called La Ceja, El Retiro, and Envigado. And we find three areas with representative land use like agricultural areas, mining projects, and non-perturbed areas. The idea was to find in a big set of simple measure and low cost measure, yes, a minimum data set to measure soil quality index in Colombia. And we want an index based on microbial indicators. We want to integrate microbial indicators in the component of this is a quality measure, soil properties, and environmental variables. And the Andesols were selected because, because it, are, it is the soils more treated in Colombia. And a lot of mining projects are working in this kind of soils. And the principal industry of agriculture is affected a lot these areas. And we measure every point. We select 90 points in three municipalities. And we measure environmental variables using a meteorological station. We measure some um, physical chemical properties like pH, conductivity, and TDS. Also, um, soil organic carbon and soil moisture. Yes, and we complement with microbial indicators, simple microbial indicators, just yes, like fungi and mesolot, uh, quantificated by play count method with different um, CFU types to obtain another measure of the 
biological condition of these soils. We select these indicators to measure soil functions affected like habitat provision or loss of biodiversity, um, organic matrix cycle by sea sequestration and respiration. Also, we measure like in the set of microbial indicators and the respiration rate of all soils. To construct, to build the MDS first, we make an OBA test to identify differences between light uses with the big set of indicators. And we test if we can integrate some of these indicators by geometric means. It's a mathematical method, very useful to integrate measure of the same nature. And then by a factor analysis joined to correlation factor, we select the more representative indicators to create NDS and the uh, set of indicators. And finally, we use a score function to qualify line uses according to NDS. We measure two methods uh, based on linear and nonlinear transformation of these indicators. And we obtain that measures like, for example, in the environmental variables, the re relative air humidity was a more representative measure um, in the physicochemical component. We identified that carbon contents and the geometric mean of moisture and carbon were very important to differentiate land uses. And the fungi abundance, it's a very important result because is thanks to this we continue with the investigation on fungi fungal and um, fungal biodiversity on our soils and we identify also that the uh, microbial respiration rate was another of the, those, the indicators very important to differentiate land uses and this picture we can see that clearly the fungal load in all soils showed clearly the impact of the use. This is the, the sample of non-perturbed areas. This is a sample from agricultural area. And this is a sample of mining project. We can see the decrease of the number of UFC. And finally, uh, to, to create the MDS, we select by factor analysis the variables with the highest load factors and that in complement doesn't have correlated just to avoid um, redundant variables in our measure. We want to create a measure with a little set with a minimum data set and avoiding redundance. And we select the respiration rate the humidity, the real, sorry, the relative air humidity, and the total dissolved solids. It's important to result to highlight that the mm, geometric means of microbial indicators have important load values. And in the next research, we use this measure to create another way to assess also quality. Left. Thanks. And finally, to convert, we convert this minimal data set by linear and nonlinear models, and we obtain that uh, um, index calculated by scoring fusion using the nonlinear model show clearly the difference between light like, uses with a uh, good degree of differentiation, you can see and pick in the graph. Um, we hope that the values of all index was highest in the non-perturbed areas, show medium values in the agriculture areas, and show the less values in mining projects. Um, the conclusion of this pilot studio was that the geometric means 
appear may be good a good, a good way for including significant variables of soil quality function. Also, that the soil quality indices calculated by nonlinear function, yes, is more sensitive to identify the disturbance and difference in land uses. And based on these results, we continue propound um, a more ro robust indicator of microbial diversity and functionality, especially on fungal communities, to create another set of um, minimal data since these indicators. And the next step um, that we are working right now is in the molecular ca characterization of fungal communities in these soils. And we are working in the APSP to the fungal nuclear reason while ITS2 region to amplify this region with the primer FITS7, ITS4, and with a quantification of glomalin concentration for salt samples. We are assessed the microbial diversity from mycorrhizal fungal, and we are made in an experiment to assess the microcorrhization percentage to include this kind of indicators in future soil quality indices more robust. I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the Cosciencia CPSP Institute for the University of Antioquia and Gaia Research Group that I take part. Thank you so yes, much. Thank you, thank you very much, Lalo. So uh, I'm sorry to say that a little bit uh, there is a little bit lag between your talk and the slides presentation, but I think uh, we can get slide. Uh, the the data and uh, later on so maybe yeah everybody can uh, give a chat for questioning uh, Raul so uh, later on so okay thank you very much and let's move on the last uh, presentation in the first part of uh, the session uh, that is given by Miss uh, Fernanda Alvarez Al uh, her title is bioturbations as the quality indicators of typic azudos in the southeast of uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, a micromorphological uh, approach. So, floor is yours. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Good morning. I am going to present my work entitled Bioturbation as Quality Indicator of Typical Arhudors in Southeast of Buenos Aires, Argentina, a micromorphological approach. This study was conducted during my internship at the Leida University whose supervisor was Dr. Apog. It was funded by the scholarship program for young research of CONICET Argentina. The soil biota contributes to the structuring of soils and biological activity is expressed through bioturbation, which is defined as the reworking of soil components by organisms. The bioturbation analysis provides information about the biological activity in the soil. In the sixth section of micromorphology, these bioturbations can be recognized as biopores, which density informs about the good soil structuring, in relation to the content of organic matter and nutrients, those they can be used as indicator of soil quality. The aim of the study is to validate a methodology for the quantification of bioporosity 
on the thin section of typic archaeodols of Argentina and analyze its possible role as indicator of soil quality. The study sites are located in the southwest of Buenos Aires province. In this area predominate the typic archaeodols and these soils are used for traditional horticultural and agricultural production. Also, it's common uh, to find areas forest, uh, forested with exotic uh, pine and eucalyptus species. The cultivated soils show a loss of a structure, organic matter, clay, aggregate stability, soil biodiversity, and increase the, of the bulk density and penetration resistance. The study sites uh, are located in the I, sorry, in the study area for plots with typic archaeodols were selected, natural plot and agricultural plot, eucalyptus globulus forest plantation and pinus radiata forest plantation. In its site, five disturbed samples were selected for determining chemical and physical properties. And on the other hand, three undisturbed samples were taken from the upper levels, soil, soil profile. From the undisturbed samples, the thin section was obtained. In the thin sections, the parameters obtained were uh, total porosity, you see in the image G hot uh, program, and bioporosity applying to methodologies. The biopores were identified as those pores with rounded edges or circular or ellipsoidal in shape. Methodology one. Uh, in the scene section where the biopores were easily recognized, an irregular polygon on the outline of the biopores was drawn using the Corel program, the Corel Draw program. Uh, the image obtained uh, were binary and the biopores area in black was calculated using image shift program. In the scene section where the biopores were not easily recognized and the area was totally bioturbated, subangular and angular aggregates were outlined in the soil matrix. The image obtained were binarized and the pores area was calculated as the bioturbated area less subangular and angular aggregates area. In methodology two, a 20 by 30 square grid was run on the image and the biopores were quantified by pound counting. The biopores area in relation to the image area was calculated following the stereological principles of the list. Um, in agricultural plots, bulk density and, re and penetration resistance were higher than natural and forest plantation plots, and structural stability and organic matter were lower than natural and forest plantation plots. These results in greater compaction a decrease in total porosity and a decrease aggregation measures. With respect to porosity and bioporosity, forested and natural plots had higher values of total porosity and biopores than agricultural plots. In these plots, the biopores in both methodologies represent more than 
80% of total porosity. While in the agricultural plots, the total porosity was lower and the biopores only had the 40% of total porosity. But methodologies for bioporosity measurements show a difference, but not significant. However, the methodology two was selected because it required a lower time of the image edition. The natural plot show a granular microstructure, a high porosity and a high bioturbation degree. Forest plots had a cram microstructure, a high porosity and a high bioturbation. In contrast, the agricultural plot show a more massive structure, a lower porosity and a lower bioturbation. The biopores of the natural and forest plots indicates an intensive fauna and root activity. The biological activity and the bioturbations in these plots are associated with the high matter organic. And this in turn contributes in the formation and stability of soil aggregates, which is reflected in a high stability structural stability. As the intensity of land use increase, the organic matter and structural stability decrease and compaction increase. Therefore, the total porosity and bioturbation decrease. Conclusions. Natural and forest plots had both a higher porosity and bioporosity than the soil the agricultural plots. Hence, aggregated biological activity can be estimated in natural and forest plots in relation to the agricultural plots. Bioturbations could constitute good soil quality indicators of the typical archivals. Finally, the methodologies for the measurement of bioporosity, in particular the methodology two, represents a contribution to the scene section description and quantification since it's a simple tool when evaluating soil quality and biological terms. Thank you very much. Gracias Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Miss uh, Miss Fernanda. So um, now, so I would like to open the uh, discussion, uh, question and answer sessions. So, in meanwhile, so uh, some of presenters already uh, answered uh, several questions. So I just. Uh, I'm not sure I can avoid overlapping, but uh, anyway, uh, first, uh, yeah, here is a question uh, to Norbin. Uh, to, uh, to what extent will the EU common agriculture policy reform focus on soil bio indicators when making payments to farmers? Are there trends of standardizing these indicators at EU level, international level? So, Ms. Nobin, so could you address this question? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I think I tried to answer in the chat. Um, so, in fact, actually, uh, in the uh, common European Common Agriculture Policy, uh, soil bio indicators are not included uh, at this moment. And um, I think we need to, first, we really need to include uh, soil and uh, uh, soils are included in the next, uh, I think, program and uh, it will be included with the carbon content and uh, also soil erosion. Uh, 
and uh, maybe my colleague can uh, i do not participate to to, to the different exchange of uh, the uh, common agricultural policy so it's just one part of the question maybe other colleagues can uh, answer and uh, there is another part of the question is about uh, your the up oh, sorry the other part is about uh, standardization of uh, bioindicators i think and uh, and i don't so i don't know if there is a standardization of bioindicators that it will be really Fault or there is a really they really want to do this, but I I know that at European level, uh, the joint research program uh, center uh, it's a joint research center it's a the European it's a European center of the European Commission, and uh, they launched in uh, December two thousand twenty the European uh, Union Soil Observatory to monitor trends of uh, soil health in Europe. And I put uh, here, you can have the link to, to see the pages of uh, this uh, program. But there will be maybe uh, my colleague Antonio who can also contribute to the response, but I think that there will be more based on the different work that are, were realized at, uh, in different member states. Okay, thank I'm you. Sorry, I don't have all the answers. So I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so and then so I'd like to move to the questions to Eva. So there are several technical questions. Uh, so I think uh, Eva already addressed uh, several uh, questions to answer, but I would like to invite uh, Eva again to uh, give a. I can say comprehensive answers because uh, there are uh, different types of uh, technical questions. So, uh, for instance, that the target of eDNA and uh, the database and why you uh, focus on eukaryotes and uh, so what's the meaning of eDNA analysis in terms of the function and activity of uh, organisms in soil. So, uh, Eva, could you address uh, these questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, we, um, we use uh, 12S, 16S, or 18S region usually to amplify, depending on what uh, group we are targeting, to assess uh, diversity of eukaryotes or bacteria, or um, different groups of animals. We can also actually look at spe specific groups, bioindicators such as uh, columbola or arthropods, for example. Uh, concerning the functions, actually, we, we can um, use uh, databases, functional databases, to, uh, to look at uh, when we have the taxonomic identifications of the organisms, we compare them to, the, to those functional databases and can assign functions to a specific uh, organism. This is how we infer functions, and this is especially true for bacteria and fungi. And also uh, for eukaryotes, we can have uh, functional databases such as NEMAGILD uh, for nematodes, for example. Um, sorry, yeah, I forgot the other questions. Um, uh, so the, the so how uh, can you detect the active or as the functional group of uh, microbes or organisms uh, via eDNA analysis? Yeah, so if, uh, whether we can identify if they are active or not in the soil, right? Mm -hmm. I think I also uh, answered this question, but it's actually impossible to differentiate between uh, living organisms or dead organisms. But actually, the dead organisms, the DNA will degrade quite, quite rapidly. So the, the proportion of uh, DNA that we find for those dead organisms compared to the living organisms will be very low, so in majority we detect living organisms. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So then... So... Sorry, I 
Let's see the any further questions. Uh, so uh, I uh, let me ask uh, Raul uh, one question. So so you showed the the, the abundance of fungi and bacteria on the uh, I mean the culture based. Uh, number of bacteria and fungi is a good indicator, but uh, so uh, now, uh, contrary, eDNA e, e analysis is now uh, so being uh, populated or some becoming more popular and popular. So uh, how do you think how the, I mean, the power of uh, culture-based analysis of microbes uh, compared to the eDNA analysis? Uh, okay, the idea with the use of culture for fungi and bacteria was to find a simple method to identify early warnings, early warnings. Yes, the, the problem with the DNA analysis is the cost. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if yeah. you need to cover a big area, you need to analyze a lot of sample. But if you have a system to identify early warnings, you can identify the hot spots when you make a DNA analysis. Uh, in the back, the next step of my research was continue with the DNA analysis of these soils. And uh, we identified the soils that could show uh, important fungal soil characteristics of futures of the biodiversity jungle in this point. And it was great because uh, when obtained the results of the DNA samples, uh, we can identify important taxa, uh, we can identify important change in specific taxons like glomalus, like um, Basidiomycota, for example. And it's uh, very important data to qualify to describe the undissolved biodiversity. Okay, thank you. Then, so uh, we have one question uh, to Maria, but actually to uh, Fernanda. So uh, have you tried to measure the bioporosity in other soil types? So could you address uh, the question, uh, Fernanda? Um. Um, sorry. May my okay. English is, is very bad. <laughs> um, uh, es, uh, excuse me, ¿cuál es la pregunta? Could you repeat the question, uh, Jan? Okay. Okay. So. The question is, uh, have you tried to measure bioporosity in other soil? Has intentado medir la bioporosidad en otros tipos de suelos, Fernanda? Si quieres, puedes contestar en español e, e intentamos eh, dar la respuesta, traducirla en al. Muchas gracias. Eh, no, recién en, comencé con esta metodología en argiudoles típicos, que son los suelos que predominan en, en mi zona de estudio. La idea es, es continuar en, en otros suelos con distintos usos. Uh, for now, no. Uh, she starts uh, with uh, with one uh, plot. I I um, I couldn't uh, catch the name of the uh, soil type. I will ask her. But the idea is to um, to amplify uh, the project in other soil types. Uh, Fernanda, podrías repetir el tipo de suelo, por favor? Que no Argiudoles, tip Argiudoles típicos. Uh, Algiudoles. I don't know how to say in English. Uh, the Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, molisols. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> eh, eh, muchas gracias, eh, Fernanda. A vos. Okay, thank you. So, uh, because we are a bit late uh, or behind the schedule, so uh, let's move to the second uh, part of our session. 
And uh, of course, uh, if you have, uh, find the questions, or if you have any questions, and uh, yeah, you can continuously put uh, your message to the chat. And uh, before I move to the second part of the session, uh, just uh, I'd like to ask all the speakers to make it sure that uh, your name uh, is correctly on the screen, so that uh, our so our uh, technicians or our yeah so host can manage uh, properly. So uh, please be sure that your name is uh, properly expressed in on the screen. Okay. Okay. So then, so let's uh, move to the second part. Okay. So uh, the the first speaker is. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, Mr. Nanan, but uh, uh, it will re it's replaced by uh, Miss uh, Miss uh, Liz uh, Komara, so the co-author. Uh, the the title is Soil Microfauna Diversity in uh, Paraselian uh, sorry Paraselian uh, Falcartaria and Moras Alba Plant Agroforestry in Bali Island. So, uh, Ms. Lily, so pro is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint now, my presentation now. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, but uh, can you switch to the presentation mode? Okay, is it okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, and good afternoon, uh, on wherever you are. Uh, I'm the second author, and I'm going to present our research about the so soil macrofauna biodiversity in Palasan Spakataria and Mons Abafen Agroforestry in Bali Island. My, our first author is Nanang Sasmita. I am the second author, uh, co-author. My name is Lilis Liskomara, and also my team, John Hardy Purba and Igde Unity. Uh, as introduction, Indonesia has a lot of agroforestry area because uh, we have a lot of forests and we have tried to find a non-forest product as uh, our second income. The Bali agroforestry model is based on mango, queso, orange, cacao, coffee, coconut, mixed garden, intercropping, and natural research protection. So uh, for the natural research protection, we find a uh, Parisian spakataria. As uh, we know, Mulberry or Mors Alba agroforestry was already test a lot because it's adapted well in the set of a lot of tree, uh, one of them is Parasantes Pacataria. Uh, as we know, that soil abundance uh, are one of the factors that increase the agroforestry land productivity uh, for the composition. The soil fauna we improve the sickle soil fertility of soil production, combine uh, topsoil materials, organic aggregate form, and soil mineral. So our study purpose was to determine the diversity of soil macrofauna on Bali agroforestry plant uh, with mulberry and Palasan spakataria. Our location is in Bali, uh, in a center of agroforestry in Bali. The location is about 100 meters above sea level and our uh, temperature is about 20 until 26 degrees Celsius. The Sangon, or in local community says it's Sangon, and the local and or is Parasan Spakataria and Mulberry Agroforestry, we, we choose for a random block design treatment. The mulberry spacing is uh, 50 times 100 centimeter for the first block, and the other one is 100 times 100 centimeters. 100 times 150 centimeters uh, under the par para science pacataria stand and for the control is the para science pacataria without any uh, without any mulberry 
each treatment was refused for three times. The macrofauna data collection using monolith hand sortation technique. The 30 times 30 centimeters for size with 30 centimeters depth, the number of floats were for per treatment is about nine floats, and that a total are 36 observation floats. The analysis of macrofauna was used to approach the species index, uh, important value, Shannon winner species, the per index, and the Shannon winner species, uh, evenness index. As the result, uh, the presence of macrofauna in the Paris Makataria and Marus Alba agroforestry field, field are we have five films uh, with uh, like Annelida with uh, one family from one family and then Mollusca two family are Trocoda for about uh, 22 family and then uh, Annelida for one family and Arthropoda for 10 family. Here is the important index value of macrofauna in Pasfakataria monoculture in percent. The Lassie plus Plafus uh, is 43.1% and the lower one is Particula auricularia. Uh, we have uh, 27 of soil macrofauna from 25 family and 21 order were found in agroforestry pattern, while monoculture pattern only found 12 species and ma uh, of macrofauna from 10 family and 10 orders. Uh, the important value index of the macrofauna, uh, 50 times 100 centimeters of Pasvakataria agroforestry in percent is 29.5 for the Lassius flavius and 2.5 for the Sianta salsiata. Two species of the soil macrofauna classified as soil engineers, which play a role of the soil organic matter decomposition, uh, namely Aphorectodea caliginosa uh, from Lumbricidae and Lumbricus rubellus also from Lumbricidae. The important value index of soil macrofauna for the space 100 times 100 centimeters plot of Pines Palparia and Mulberry agroforestry. Uh, also, let's use Plavius has the higher one, and the lower one is Sianta calceata. The index value for the soil macrofauna at 150 times 100 centimeters for Pines Palparia and Mulberry is. Uh, the Aporactodia caliginosa is the highest one, and the lower one is Robedimus triatelus. The pattern of Parasitus pacataria and Mulberry agroforestry spacing uh, 50 times 100, 100 times 100 centimeters, and 150 times 100 centimeters were dominated by Aporactodia caliginosa from Rubicidae. Lassius plapus from Formicidae, uh, Philophaga zafana, uh, Crabidae, then Philophaga zafana is mostly in agroforestry land related to the manure provision. Here is the soil macrofauna biodiversity index. Uh, as a, uh, our results find that we have uh, individual for 12 monoculture and the whole individual is 53 in the monoculture. And for the agroforestry uh, with 50 and 100 centimeters time is more larger than the monoculture. So it's in the agroforestry with 100, 100 centimeters uh, plot and 150 centimeters plot. From here, we can see that uh, the, the tiger, the titan uh, space the small space plot uh, is more higher than the others. The Senan winner diversity index between 2.44 until 2.50 H uh, for the agroforestry. So the diversity of soil macrofauna in medium category agroforestry pattern is greater, greater than one. Uh, so uh, even touch also the monocultures. The richest of soil, uh, soil macrofauna in monoculture is 2.77 while agroforestry is 3.21 until 3.33. The wealth value of the monoculture macrofauna is relatively low. 
uh, lower than 3.5, while the Paranasus falcataria and mulberry agroforestry is classified as moderate, is more than 3.5. The species evenness show that the monoculture and agroforestry pattern are not much different, with the level evenness large enough, uh, 0.89 to 0.92, so that the species is spread evenly. The diversity of soil macrofauna in Paracet Pacataria and mulberry agroforestry is higher, the planting distance is uh, getting tighter, the index diversity is increased. So, uh, you know that uh, we can find that the plot with uh, small area, more small area, uh, the diversity is more higher. The soil macrofauna species number in agroforestry are related to the available and quality of the soil organic matter and the remnant of uh, plant biomass as a food source. As a conclusion, soil macrofauna in agroforestry were found in 27 species from 20 pine from 25 families and 21 order. The diversity and richness of soil macrofauna species in the Paracetaria and mulberry agroforestry system are classified as moderate, uh, 20.44 until 2.58. The dominant you macrofauna are Afrotodia, Caliginosa, Lumbricus rubellus, uh, Philophaga zafana, and Solenopsis invicta. Uh, Lumbricus rubellus litter eater warmer are effective in organic matter decomposition. It can increase soil fertility and nutrient availability because the process of decomposition of organic matters become two until five times faster than without the presence of the organism. The effect of plant spacing on soil macrofauna community structure is relatively moderate at tight spaces with mean, uh, with mean index are about 3.50. 53. Macrofauna diversity in the soil saw a relatively high correlation with soil organic matter content, the dominance of lower vegetation and soil moisture. Uh, macrofauna diversity at ground level saw a relatively high correlation with plant spacing and sunlight penetration. Uh, that is our presentation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Lilis. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, then, so next speaker is Ms. Esperanza uh, Fuerta Luanga. Uh, the title is Soil Macroinvertebrates Diversity and uh, Glyphosate Distribution in Soybean Plantations and Surroundings at uh, Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. So, uh, Ms. Esperanza, floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. So I will I will share my screen. And then in the moon. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for being here present. And as the chairman has said, I will present a work uh, uh, related to soil macroinvertebrates and the presence of one of the herbicides that is more, more used in, in the world, glyphosate. So um, this is a teamwork. This is a work done in, with Bajene University and also El Colegio de la Frontera Sur in Mexico. Okay, like introduction, uh, glyphosate uh, it, and its main metabolite AMPA are even after years of application present in soils. So they remain in soil after years of application. And AMPA accumulates on site attached to the clay particles. And this situation underlies the risk of off-site transport by water and wind erosion. At the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, Genetically modified glyphosate tolerant crops have led to the intensive use of glyphosate. Previous investigations indicated the contamination of humans by this herbicide in Yucatan. So it, because of the time, I'm not going to explain what is happening um, and connect because as you know, the Yucatan Peninsula has a very, very uh, small soil. We can say it's not deep soil. So in most of the parts of the, of the peninsula. 
So I'm not going to explain those things. I'm going to focus on soil invertebrates. So um, soil invertebrates, uh, we have litter fragmenters and soil ecosystem engineers. As we have here during the, the Congress, uh, the importance of the biodiversity of these invertebrates in order to, uh, to have soil good conditions, soil health conditions. So they are known as bio, bio, bio indicators of soil quality. So they help in soil organic, soil organic decomposition, uh, infiltration, aeration of the soil. So we have heard all about this. So here just I'm showing you some photos uh, for instance, uh, coleopteras, ants, uh, earthworms, no? soil ecosystem engineers, and the larva of coleoptera. So, things that are working in the soil. So, here is a nice schema of ground metal 2000, for, where we can see how different kinds of earthworms interact in the soil. So, we have the, those that live above the soil, the epijake, those that live inside the soil, endojake and the anesic that move below and above ground. We have also heard during this Congress how these different type of earthworms interact and contribute to the soil ecosystem. Okay, so what were the objectives of this study? Uh, were to, to measure glyphosate and AMPA in soils from the soybean crops and also to determine soil macroinvertebrate diversity and abundance in those places. So the study was done, as I mentioned, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So here you can see uh, this is the Gulf of Mexico, and here is the Yucatan Peninsula and Campeche. Campeche is one of the states located here. So we did a study in Chenco at this part. OK, so the experimental design. We measured, uh, we took soil samples at the soybean field. So you see at the left side of your slide in orange color, uh, the soybean field. And then we, we put a transect from the soybean field into the natural vegetation. So we took also samples there. And after we took samples also in the natural vegetation. So we a total of 25 samples per combination of uh, crop field, crop field with natural vegetation, and then we did the same eight times. So we measured the same design and uh, eight times. So we in soybean fields, fields, and also in maize fields. So here you can see a little photo, more or less how it looks uh, the soybean. Yeah. Okay. So we had a total of two hundred all samples. Uh, they were taken for glyphosate and AMPA determination, and we determined these uh, pollutants in the laboratory. So we measured, we took a, a monolith, also 200 monoliths uh, by, by the TSBF method. We measured also organic matter and clay, and we calculated a ratio glyphosate invertebrates as results. Okay, you are seeing in your slide, in the left side of your slide, you are seeing uh, the concentration of glyphosate per uh, type of land management. So uh, the concentration was higher, glyphosate and AMPA in the soybean plantation. So you can see here where I'm pointing with my mouse. And after we found also glyphosate and AMPA in the non-managed area, in the natural areas. So that is not nice because, uh, yeah, that means that there is a, a drift with wind or water to the natural areas. And we found also glyphosate and AMPA in the maize crops. Yeah. And what is what is happening with the with the invertebrates? So it is in very is a kind of inverse relationship. So the lowest abundance of soil invertebrates was, uh, was found in the soybean plantation. So it's the lowest. And then we found in the middle, in the non-management area, in the natural area. And after the highest abundance was found in the maize crop. So that was very surprised for us because we found uh, 
yeah, an effect of glyphosate on the abundance of the invertebrates. So the natural vegetation is affected. So we found low abundance. Okay, if we go more into the detail, so here we have in this table, in the left side, the type of uh, land management, soybean, maize, and non-managed area. And then we have the main um, yeah, principal taxa that we found in this study. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, shit, pardon. <laughs> well, this can happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so what we have here is, uh, yeah, the principal taxa found in the study. So ants, earthworms, coleoptera, termites, gastropods. So what we can see in this table as most important that gastropods were absent, completely absent in the soybean field. They were abundant in maize and also in the natural vegetation. We found earthworms in the natural vegetation and also in maize, but not, uh, uh, er, yeah, yeah, more, the highest. The highest abundance of earthworms was found in the natural vegetation. Mm -hmm. And the ratio, in relation to the ratio glyphosate, Invertebrates, uh, the highest ratio was in the soybean field, and then after in the managed, non managed area, and then in the maize crop. So these are the main findings. Okay, discussion. Glyphosate is a component known to harm humans, soil life, and wildlife. In this study, we found this. Of taxa, so it's, it's a few compared to another studies also in the region. Uh, in the region, you, you can find from one to nine taxa, but because of the perturbation, we found less here. Gasteropodas most were the most vulnerable group in this study. They were not present in the soybean plantations. Okay, you have one so, more test. Uh, thank you. Thank you ah, for your oh. attention. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for keeping the time. So I appreciate it. So, okay. So then, uh, because uh, the last presenters has a time limitation, so uh, let let me move uh, immediately move to the the third presenters, uh, Miss uh, Quintia. Sorry, I cannot pronounce properly. Kala Niva, so from Brazil. So. Uh, her uh, presentation is about NK traits in two uh, phytophthalmies uh, oh, no, of uh, Brazilian salad. Okay, so uh, Miss Cynthia, uh, so the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. I'm sharing the screen now, just a minute. Yes, maybe uh, Esperanza, please. Yeah. Is it on screen? Yes, and uh, could you, ah, perfect. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Greetings from Brazil. Well, today I will talk about partial results of the first findings of a bigger ongoing project on Nanki trades in, in Cerrado Biome in Brazil. Nanki trades are these small, Analyte or oligoquid worms, which live in soils worldwide, but there are also aquatic and marine ones. They are saprophagus, microbivore, known to play a role in nutrient cycling and soil structure. The knowledge on these animals remain largely unknown in most places and even more in the tropics, and that's the case in Brazil. Cerrado is one of the six biomes in Brazil. It's considered a hotspot of biodiversity and endemic species, which occupies mainly the central region of the country. And it has two well-marked seasons, a dry one and a rainy one. Soils are, are naturally acid and considered of low fertility. But Cerrado has been increasingly taken by the expanding agriculture and livestock activities over the last 40 years. Uh, as a result of a lot of applied technology. About half of the area is still covered uh, with natural vegetation, 
but the loss and conservation of biodiversity uh, have been a matter of concern in this biome. So studies on animals sensitive to environmental changes are urgently needed, considering, considering the current threats. The presence of enchytrates uh, has been reported a couple of times in Cerrado biome in the past, but sampling had been performed with inappropriate methods to determine abundance accurately. Genus and species composition has never been studied either until this project has started. So the objective of the present study is to determine enchytrate density and generic composition in two phytophysiognomies of Cerrado biome to support the use of these organisms to the monitoring of soil biological quality, soil biodiversity loss, and sustainability of production systems. So two types of Cerrado vegetation were sampled for enchytrates. A gallery forest, uh, which is more humid because it's close to water, has taller trees and close canopy. And it's also uh, the, the glacial is, is covered by a thick layer of organic matter. On the other hand, uh, Cerrado Senso Stricto, which is a typical Cerrado, uh, it has shorter trees and shrubs and a more open vegetation on feral soil. Sampling took place in two well-preserved areas um, in Brazilian National Park and Brasilia Botanical Garden. Those are places in the capital of Brazil. Sampling was carried out at 10 points distant 10 to 15 meters uh, in the plot once a year at the end of rainy season in 2017 and 18 and once in the dry season of a previous year. Sampling and extraction procedures were based on ISO guidelines, uh, recommendations for enchytrate sampling. A metal ring uh, was used to sample soil at each point, and then the soil was taken to the laboratory uh, to a hot extraction device made of funnels full of water and lamps to force the worms to move downwards so that they can be collected and counted. After that, live specimens were identified under optic microscope up to genus level. Fixed specimens were used for species determination. Chemical and granulometry analysis were also carried out. So results. This first graph shows the number of enchytrates per square meter and the sampling sites and the dates of sampling. The lower graph shows the percentage of individuals of each genus represented by different color at each corresponding site and date. Generally speaking, enchytrates rates were more abundant, abundant in 2018 than 2017, reaching the mark of 3,000 individuals per square meter of enchytrate rate density in gallery forest in botanical garden. Um, the typical Cerrado showed a lower density of enchytrate worms when compared to calorie forest. In dry season, practically zero individuals were found. It's noteworthy that an extremely severe drought occurred in 2016, what could have impacted the enchytrate community in 2017. Uh, in terms of genus composition, a maximum of six known genera were found but the genus composition varied uh, with site and year. Typical Cerrado, here and here, at the National Park, revealed lower richness than gallery forest. Genus Guaranidrilos in yellow, Emenchytrios in blue, and SPR, which is a potentially new genus in green, they were the predominant groups. A principal analysis, uh, components analysis was performed with soil chemical and texture variables and genus density and richness of enchytrates. It separated the vegetation types, so typical Cerrado and gallery forests, and also the locations, so botanical garden and national park. 
it also uh, showed a po positive correlations between um, genus richness uh, with organic matter and soil fertility attributes. In the world, uh, more than 700 species belonging to 33 genera are known, while in Latin America, only 62 species of these 15 genera are known. Uh, 32 species uh, occur in Brazil and they are native. In, in the present study, we identified two already known species and six potentially new species. One of, one of the Guaranidrillus species is possibly a new genus due to unique combinations of characteristics. So conclusions, Cerrado can harbor quite high densities of enchytrates, which is comparable to other biomes in Brazil and temperate countries. So far, together with data collected in other sites of Cerrado, we found species of eight different genera and about 20 or more different species. Uh, six to seven genera and six potentially new species were found in the two sites uh, which data were presented here. So there is a, there's still a huge area of Cerrado and also other regions in Brazil to be explored for enchytrates. I'm very grateful to my colleagues and students who embarked in this project to unravel the wonders of these tiny worms. And if you are interested in facing this challenge together, you are very welcome to join us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Cynthia, so for your nice presentation. So, and also I appreciate uh, your keeping time of presentation. So now, I, yeah, so thank you. So, and then, so let's move to the last presentation. So uh, that is given by Miss Stephanie uh, Christman uh, from Morocco. Uh, her, uh, the title is Regard and Protect Ground Nesting Bees at Part of Soil Biodiversity. So Miss Stephanie, please. Do you see my screen? Yes, and could you change uh, to the presentation mode? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, which? Oh, yeah, yes, perfect. Yeah. yeah. We change uh, a bit the topic um, because now uh, I would like uh, to shift your attention uh, to more regard uh, uh, for the need to protect uh, ground nesting uh, pollinators also as part of uh, soil bi uh, biodiversity. For instance, this nice sand bee on the right, it uh, needs the soil for regeneration. Uh, and um, I think we have to uh, protect them uh, more. Um, I, this is very much disturbing here. Uh, the European Union, uh, the World Food Organization, and also uh, the Global Soil Partnership, um, they have a definition of uh, soil biodiversity, which is focused on the provision of uh, for ecosystem services by soil biota. And this definition excludes wild pollinators, um, though uh, they depend on um, uh, soil as a habitat for regeneration. And I think this is a bit a risky uh, strategy because uh, 60 to 70 um, percent of all uh, wild bees and all solitary wasps, so the most effective uh, wild pollinators, uh, nest in the ground. And um, when you look on our agricultural landscapes, uh, for those who need, for instance, um, dead wood or uh, hollow stems, uh, they will not find it uh, in uh, um, landscape with monocultures. So they disappear from um, uh, agricultural uh, lands. And uh, when you sample in such landscapes, you will find uh, mostly ground nesting pollinators, but um, 
they are also under very heavy threat. And they also don't fly far. For instance, bumblebees, that social bees, uh, which build colonies of 200 or uh, 300 um, species, and they fly up to two kilometers. But most of them, in particular the solitary bees, they fly uh, up to uh, one kilometer, not further. Uh, so uh, they are very much in need to have a, a safe um, um, part in, in the fields uh, where they can regenerate. Uh, when you look at uh, their life cycle, there is a short period when they are flying and when the adults are pollinating, but a long period is below soil. And um, of course, in early spring, uh, the adults make uh, several nests, but uh, during this uh, period of uh, larval development uh, or adults in the ground, if there is a deep tillage, uh, the uh, next generation is gone. Additionally, we have uh, the problem that chemicals accumulate in soil and um, neonicotinoids, for instance, uh, uh, up to 94% uh, accumulate in soil uh, and water. When you imagine a, a female wild bee uh, digging all the cavities uh, to lay uh, the eggs, uh, this can be toxic and uh, the regeneration uh, is at risk. But this is very risky as 87% of all flowering plants depend on pollinators. Uh, they depend on pollinators for regeneration and also for adaptation to climate change because cross-pollination enhances genetic diversity and thus the chance uh, to adapt to climate change. So many of these plants are important uh, for soil fertility and um, for soil uh, biodiversity. Uh, for instance, the Fabac BK, uh, they uh, have the nitrogen fixation, uh, which is important for soil fertility, or Facelia, or for instance, wild rose, uh, they uh, prevent soil erosion. Um, in, in a world uh, with a heavy loss of uh, pollinators, a very strong decline, uh, when you have a degraded land like here in these slopes, it would be very difficult uh, to do any conservation measures for soil biodiversity or combat of erosion uh, if you don't have all the plants anymore uh, which are pollinator dependent. I think the uh, full impacts of pollinos pollinator loss are not yet um, understood. As 87% of all um, flowering plants depend on pollinators, really a high uh, extent of uh, ecosystem services, which you see here um, in bright green, depend on pollinators. And if um, uh, pollinators um, get very scarce and we lose at the same time uh, these ecosystem services, uh, to a great extent, for instance, erosion prevention, so, uh, soil fertility, habitat uh, for species, uh, wastewater uh, treatment, and so on, uh, then uh, we uh, get into an interlinked spiral of environmental degradation and later of economic and social degradation. Uh, for instance, in mountain regions, um, people uh, can even abandon their land because they have such increase of mud flows, they cannot produce pollinator dependent crops anymore, no medicinal plants anymore, um, and uh, labor migration of use that the old people uh, cannot manage uh, to stay there anymore. Uh, so in total, um, we might even get more conflicts uh, because uh, there is a lot of migration. This is a worst case scenario, which can be fueled by climate change, which we should avoid for sure. Therefore, I would suggest to consider uh, that uh, the Global Soil Partnership uh, uses a, a definition like um, the CBD, which is habitat oriented. And then um, wild pollinators, um, which nest in the ground would be included into uh, the definition and in consequence also in the protection measures of the Global Soil Partnership. 
The second uh, thing I want to suggest is uh, to promote uh, farming with alternative uh, pollinators briefly FAP, and to assess if this has also positive effects uh, for uh, soil biodiversity. Um, FAP is a measure to intensify production uh, by a better use of two ecosystem services, pollination and pest control. And uh, the result is higher income per surface. So a fab field has the main crop uh, in a part of the field here, the dark green parts and habitat enhancement uh, in the uh, smaller parts of the field, which is here bright green. Habitat enhancement is done by marketable habitat enhancement plants only, like spices, oil seeds, um, medicinal plants, uh, berries, um, vegetables, what, whatever you want. And it can be perennial plants or uh, annual plants. And then either packed soil for the ground nesting bees or hollow stems or uh, dead wood with uh, boreholes and so on as nesting support for um, wild pollinators. And then we measure the impacts on insect diversity and abundance for pollinators, natural enemies and pests and the net income per surface. And uh, the net income per surface is much, much higher from fab fields than from control fields, which uh, have just um, monocultural, uh, uh, the main crop. So I think if um, the Global Soil Partnership would promote uh, such an approach with uh, areas where ground nesting bees uh, or ground nesting webs, webs uh, can uh, regenerate, uh, that would be of uh, great value. And also, I think it would be nice to see if uh, there is a difference, if it is uh, annual or perennial marketable habitat uh, enhancement plants, and what are best options uh, to get synergies also for um, soil biodiversity through this approach. Yeah. These are my suggestions, and um, maybe uh, some of you uh, would be ready to consider them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for your nice presentation that just expand our view uh, about the soil biodiversity. So uh, now we'd like to open the Q&A session. So, and because I heard that uh, Stephanie uh, has to leave earlier, so I have I'd like to take the uh, question to her, Stephanie. So right now, so far, yes, I think uh, still uh, we have no questions to uh, Stephanie. So, but uh, you, I think you can stay for, for a while. <laughs> okay. Okay, so then, so, because uh, 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 we don't have much, uh, many questions. So, so uh, uh, let's move to the first presentation by Lily. So uh, there are some questions to her, so to Lily. So about the plant species. So you used two different uh, plants. So mulberry and uh, so the uh, forest, uh, the tree. And the uh, uh, question is, uh, are they native in Bali or exotic? Okay. Uh, the, uh, is it a mulberry? First question from, I'm sorry, from Jonathan Carter about the mulberry indigenous in Bali. Yes, there's a few mulberry were indigenous in Bali, such as, uh, what is it called? Black mulberry, it's really uh, in, uh, indigenous in Bali. Uh, and also like Morus nigra is also indigenous. Uh, the second question is the most important species in our study, in your study. I've already uh, answered it in, in the chat, there's a few uh, important, but the uh, most of them is uh, the important one is uh, was it worm and ant? 
there's two species there yeah? and then uh, the ex this spacing treatment are related to the plant use uh, yes uh, in the in our in our agroforestry there are um, we try to find uh, what is the right what is the right plot? I mean, the right distance from the one uh, from one uh, mulberry to to the other. So we try a few like fifty two uh, centimeters to a, a one a hundred centimeters. This uh, after this uh, study, we find that the the one with uh, fifty and a hundred centimeters times a hundred centimeters is the most uh rich for the fauna uh, and so is the the leaf is more better than the others uh as you know that mulberry in ours uh, in ours agroforestry is for the silkworm for feeding the sweet worm so we we have to uh take uh, to find a lot of uh leaves for the silk worms and then are the dominant species native of Bali or exotic? I can't understand this one, but I think uh, if it's the mulberry or the fauna. Mm -hmm. Is it for the berry or uh, the mulberry or for the for the fauna? Fauna. For the fauna. Okay. Uh, the dominant species uh, is native in uh, from the from the <laughs> soil in Bali. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's all. Okay, and the, the last question is: uh, You measure the different soil parameters. So, uh, do you did you find any relationship uh, between the microfauna and uh, soil properties? Oh, with the yeah, the the pH other uh, property. Hmm? Uh, usually, uh, in our land, uh, I mean, in our soil, when there is a lot of fauna, uh, there must be a lot of uh, the composition. That's why the pH is a little uh, what acid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe oh, this all. Okay. Yes. So then, uh, yeah, it's almost time, and uh, I have no further or urgent questions on the chat. So, uh, Rosa, uh, uh, do we? still uh, able to put input uh, question on chat after the session or yes of course if there's somebody um that um wants to to ask um, um complementary questions um we can we can stay a few more minutes okay okay thank you Please feel feel free to to type in in the chat if you if you you have doubts comments. Mm -hmm. So then, so uh, so uh, for the moment, I would like to uh, thank all the presenters and also the the participant to join this session. And uh, so thank you very much for your kind contribution replace webinars so uh now we have a chat uh they're asking how to find the replace of webinars uh rosa can you answer this so are uh, you recording the this session so how uh, how we can replay this you we can we visit the file uh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we will uh, publish uh, after the symposium, of course, all the material, including the the recording uh, sessions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, so now it's time. So uh, yeah. So uh, we still open this session for a while. So please uh, put any uh, feedback. And also, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. And also, I wish all the uh, good day and good night. And also, uh, uh, you can continue continuously enjoy the the next two uh, days of this symposium. Yeah. Uh, 
And uh, so, uh, Rosa, do you have any uh, further comment? No, no. Okay, okay. So then, so uh, thank you very much all and have a good day and have a good night. So uh, see you next day. So Rosa, thank you very much for you are, you are helping the session. So I I didn't know I, I wasn't uh, seen by by you because I I, I had been in the uh, in in the session, but uh, so maybe no one could identify me. <laughs> yes, I saw um, I saw one uh, name maybe in Japanese. But I didn't <laughs> yes, know. Sorry, so I, so, I forgot so to change. Sorry, I'm sorry. So I I forgot to change my ID so into English. So yeah, I appreciate your help. No, no, no problem. <laughs>